He gave me life. He saved my sisters. And I couldn't ask for any more. Anybody who was related to us in Poland had died at the hands of the Nazis. And we were the only ones that survived. And the reason we survived is because we ended up on Schindler's list. You know, he bribed everything. He did everything with money or with gifts or whatever he did. And he accomplished it. He was, to us, he was an angel. Oscar was the oldest of two children. He had a little sister named Elfrida. They loved each other dearly. His mother, Louisa, like other mothers of the day, ran their middle-class household. Though the family was Catholic, it was only Louisa who practiced the faith. An important influence on young Oscar was a Jewish family living next door. He went to grammar school and played with their two boys. Ordinarily, a friendship between neighbors wouldn't be significant. In this case, it was. In his teens, Oscar was uninterested in academia, though he did finish high school. The mechanical know-how he'd gained in his father's farm machine factory led to tinkering with Hans Schindler's motor car. Later, Oscar turned to motorcycles. He loved the speed, the sense of danger, and he thrived on being in the limelight. Oscar had many girlfriends. Then, in 1928, at the age of 20, he appeared to settle down. After a whirlwind courtship, he married a gentleman farmer's daughter named Emily Peltzel. Emily had been schooled in a convent and was as reserved as Oscar was reckless. Oscar received a sizable dowry when he got married. According to Emily, he soon bought an expensive car and squandered the rest. In the early 1930s, Oscar entered the military, serving in the Czechoslovakian army. He hated the rules and regulations and got out as soon as he could. After his military service, Oscar returned to Emily, but only in theory. By day, he worked as sales manager at Moravian Electrotechnic. At night, instead of going home, he lived the life of a bachelor staying out and carousing in the cafes. In 1935, when Oscar was 27, his father abandoned his mother. There was no divorce. Three years later, she died, alone and brokenhearted. Oscar was devastated. At her funeral, he refused to speak to his father. He'd never forgiven him for leaving his mother. It was during this period that Oscar surprised friends and family by wearing a swastika. He had joined the Nazi party. He got involved in the Nazi party because it was good for business. He wanted to make a lot of money, and he did make a lot of money. As the National Socialist Party in Germany continued to expand under Adolf Hitler, newcomers were avidly sought after. Oscar signed on with the Abwehr, the German intelligence agency. The Abwehr sent Oscar to Krakow, Poland, to pose as a businessman and gather information on the Gestapo and the German army. Like most regimes, the Third Reich had its share of factions and rivalries. Oscar looked forward to his mission. He saw Krakow as a city full of possibilities. On September 1st, 1939, the Nazi Blitzkrieg stormed into Poland and began its brutal occupation. One week later, Oscar Schindler, 31 years old, arrived in Krakow as an agent for the Abwehr, the German intelligence organization. His disarming smile, quick wit, and ability to disguise a bribe as a gift of friendship helped make all the right connections. The Krakow that Schindler came to exploit was a bustling industrial city with a thriving Jewish community, 66,000 in all. But when Hitler's armies invaded Poland, the Jews of Krakow, as well as Poland's other three and a half million Jews, were soon set apart from the rest of society. The Nazis decreed that all Jews, 
over the age of 10, wear the Star of David, a Jewish icon. Schindler witnessed Nazis evicting Jews from their apartments at will, herding them into ghettos, then moving into their vacant residences. The Nazis also took over their businesses, retaining Jewish workers as slave labor. Schindler had the full privileges of a Nazi, and he understood he could benefit from the Jews' misfortune. He began inquiring about a formerly Jewish-owned factory on the outskirts of Krakow. On the advice of Itzhak Stern, a Jewish accountant he'd met, Schindler decided to take over the factory with Stern running the books. Schindler was convinced he could acquire lucrative military contracts by producing field kitchenware and mess kits for German soldiers. From their first meeting, Schindler and Stern formed an immediate bond. When Schindler turned their conversation to the war, to the rampant killing, to religion, Stern saw an opening to plant a seed. He expressed a fine point of Talmudic wisdom. He who saves a single life saves the world entire. The remark was not lost on Schindler. DEF, Deutsche Emile Fabrik, known by its workers as Emalia for short, soon became quite a success. Schindler, the operator, made the deals. Behind the scenes, he relied on his staff. Schindler had the business sense and the heart to treat his Jewish laborers humanely, often with a smile, a joke, or an unexpected kindness. He came to my workstation and called me by my name and uh, occasionally asked me things, not because he wanted to really have the information, but he just wanted to make human contact with somebody like me, who was 13 years old. And then I'd find out the following day that when I went to get my ration of soup, that I was supposed to get two rations, because Schindler had ordered double ration for me. That's the kind of person he was. There was even more compelling evidence of the fact that Schindler was different from the other Nazis. He warned his Jews of upcoming auctions, calculated incidents in which the Gestapo would terrorize and kill Krakow's Jews. A kind of covenant developed between Oscar Schindler and his prisoners. It was a very rough covenant, but it basically said, you run my factory and keep things chugging over, and I'll keep the dogs and the jackboots and the lash and the rifle off the factory floor. As a result, Emalia earned a reputation as a haven from Nazi brutality. Krakow's Jews sought to work there, and Schindler was all too eager to accommodate them. For taking on more Jews made good economic sense, Although the Jews themselves weren't paid, Schindler still had to send their wages to the SS. But at just six marks a day, about two dollars apiece, Jewish labor was a better deal than higher-priced Polish workers. While Schindler defied Nazi law by treating his Jews humanely, he also broke the rules of marriage Schindler kept his wife Emily back home, far from Krakow, where he had countless sexual liaisons with a German mistress, his Polish secretary, and many other beautiful women. By January 1945, the war was going badly for the Nazis, and defeat was imminent. Adolf Hitler was nonetheless determined to complete his self-proclaimed mission to resolve the Jewish question. The Nazis had nearly succeeded in exterminating all of Europe's eight million Jews. Oskar Schindler was at cross purposes with the Nazi regime. He had brought some 1,100 Jews to his war essential factory in Brinlitz, Czechoslovakia. Schindler had now been joined by his wife, Emily, would come from their nearby hometown, Zvitau. Emily was as horrified as Oscar of the Nazi atrocities. 
On the eve of May 8th, 1945, Oskar Schindler had important information that the Jews in his care had waited five years to hear. Schindler asked us all to gather around. He stood up on something high, and he told us that... Uh, the unconditional surrender of Germany has just been announced. At midnight tonight, the war is over. We were, we were free. The war is over. The Germans have surrendered, and that he was going to leave, and these guards who were standing around behind him were going to leave as well, and he wished as well. Everyone there was in, either in tears or in laughs or trying to crawl toward Schindler to kiss him and thank him personally, which was impossible to do with a thousand people. It was an emotionally charged uh, gathering uh, where we just uh, were short of being able to express our feelings, the unbelievable achievements that we have survived the war, and it was Oscar Schindler that uh, brought us to this point. The 12 or 1300 Jews Schindler had saved would soon learn of the extent of the Nazi Holocaust. Six million other Jews had not had an Oskar Schindler to come to their aid, and they had perished. The people who Oskar Schindler fed and protected for four and a half years knew when the Russian will take camp of ours, he as a German, as a Nazi, as a profiteer, as a manager of the concentration camp factory, he will have not have a chance to survive. He was 37 years old and faced the turbulence of the post-war world. Germany's economy was a shambles. So were Oscar's finances. Despite the millions he'd made during the war, he'd walked away a pauper. Schindler was undeniably a hero, but outside of the survivors who owed him their lives, no one knew or cared. In 1949, a Jewish organization awarded him $15,000. It was the first of many financial gifts bestowed upon him by a grateful Jewish community. I learned from this movie is that life was full of miracles and hope, even in times of war and need. And even though we, we save the life, there's still guilt inside you today. You should have saved more lives. After watching the movie, I learned how to value life based on its right that Schindler's did to symbolize life. Because of the list of people that was Star Schindler saves. Also, I learned that we should always treat each other equal and respect each other. Years this made me learn that being selfish doesn't make any sense what never happens to yourself. Even though that is near you, risking yourself to fight for that, for that battle is a very big help in order to save those people who are around you. Whoever saves one's life, save, and save the entire world. That was that Talmudic phrase being engraved by the factory worker which made me realize that this, this movie plays an important role in our country. I learned and I feel the will to survive of the characters because in their situation, in their life, in the movie, it is very, very unfair, not very moral, but the difference 
one individual can make is very powerful. Like Schindler done very heroic against the Jews. In the first, he has his own motive to make money and that's it. But he risks his life for others because he sees the wrongdoings of others. And I still believe that good is still in every one of us. Not giving up, no matter what struggles you face, and doing what you can, even if it only amounts to a small portion, and also sacrificing what you can by leaving some for yourself, can accomplish a lot and lead to a better outcome than what you have done. Isa sa tuwa ko ang mga aral ng aking natutunan sa piliin mo lang pinanood sa amin sa paraan din ng pagtulong sa aking kapwa na walang kapalit. Bilang sa aking mga kamukhanan o kaibigan, pati na rin sa tao na nangailangan sa aking kapaligiran. If the time comes when there's calamity in our country or in other country that needs help, I will do my best to help, and I would make my friends donate or help the people in need. I can apply the lesson I learned from Sinclair's kids by thinking always positive in life, no matter what problems come, like the Jews on the movies. They are always thinking positive. Applying the lessons from my life means that I will also do what Shinders did. I would also love to help anybody with nothing else in return. Money is important for those Jewish investors, but agreeing to accept goods as a payment will be more essential if I, I were give, to give those people who are in need. Goods will be more efficient. How can I apply? Maybe I'll try my very best to always consider the, the feelings of others just to avoid conflict. I think I'm matured enough to put down my self interest and ego just to make peace and rightful, rightful decision. If I was a Jew, I would have done everything I could to be seen as a valuable asset to the Nazi party. And if I was a Nazi, I would have done everything I could to end the war early. But if I was Schindler, I would have done the same thing. Kung ako ay nasa kapareho palagay ni Oscar Schindler, nagtulong din ako sa mga tao na nga may lakad kahit pa lang ako. If I was in the same situation as last question, I would also help the Jews to be safe up to the next time that I would give my life to just for them. If I were given the same type of situation, I would choose to be a star changers because we value the life of the Jews and how we do our best to have those who are in peace. I will give the same light situation. I will confront also the same what she does did to those people. Religion, money, power will do nothing in order to help those people who are needed. I will also risk myself for my family and loved ones. I will do everything for them. In the same situation, I think I'll fight but not like Schindler, like risking my life for others. I don't think I can't do that now but I'll try my best to fight in the rightful way, in the safest way and that's all. Thank you.